church. It is good to be together this morning. And I'm flying solo this morning. But Sarah is at an ordination service for one of her students, just as a little aside. But, uh, so have you ever, maybe once in your life, walked into a room and then asked, why am I here? Kind of looked around wondering the purpose for which you entered that room. So we have our, uh, in our house, our, our kind of pantry closet is down in the basement. And on more than one occasion, I have walked downstairs, walked to the pantry closet, opened it and thought, what am I getting? Why am I here? Then I have to yell up to Sarah, right? And say like, what did you need? What do you want? Um, so that, you know, I think that probably happens to all of us. But on, on a more, on a more little, slightly more significant and serious note, I think many times as people, right, we might find ourselves asking the bigger question, why am I here? Like, why am I actually here uh, in this life? What is my purpose? Or who am I? Some of these big questions that we ask. Um, what makes me me? You know, what's my identity? Some of the big questions that tend to circle around. Um, sometimes at some periods in life, right, they hit us more than others, right? as you may be launching into the world and you're trying to figure out who you are. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Or maybe you're walking through a big change in life and you're also sort of wondering, what's my purpose again? Why am I here? Uh, in the ancient world, right, the answer to these questions, people have asked these questions for a long time. They're not new to us. Uh, and in the ancient world, there are stories, we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about Genesis 1 and how it fits into um, the ancient world and that other cultures around them had stories about where they came from, how the world was made. And we talked about that there were the gods who fought and battled and created the earth and that there were many gods and they were part of their creation. They were kind of locked inside it. But humans also played a role in those stories. And in those accounts, in many of them, humans come in towards the end, and they're often created to do the work of the lesser gods. So the lesser gods get tired, they start to grumble, the, like the, the lower gods in the, in the ranking of gods, and they get sick of the work that they're doing. And so humanity gets created to do the work of these lesser gods, to feed and sustain the other gods. And so humanity's purpose in many of these stories is simply to feed and care for the gods, so that the gods would then keep the chaos at bay and keep things working. And so you had this answer to why you were here, and that was to feed and tend to the gods. But when we come to Genesis 1 and the sixth day and last of God's creative days, we encounter uh, the longest and most descriptive day. As Sarah highlighted last week, Genesis 1 is structured right with three days of forming and three days then of filling. And we will, next week there'll be more talk about day seven and Sabbath, uh, which is the pinnacle of the account. But the sixth day, the sixth day that has much that says, pay attention, pay attention to this day. Because it's in this, uh, in this day that we find the creation account of humanity. And the sixth day, as I noted, is, stands out for a couple of reasons in the overarching account of Genesis 1. There are a couple of things that say, pay attention. One, it is the longest. There's the most description in day six than any of the other days. So when you get to something that all of a sudden, the pace of the Bible slows down and there's more detail, that's a little light going off saying, pay attention here. What's going on? Something interesting is happening. And... I'm sure you've always been wanting to know how many words were in each of the days of creation. So I counted them for you. Um, so just in case, now I counted fast. So don't, if you go home and check me, I counted in the Hebrew, but if you go home and check me with your Hebrew copies, uh, I might have something wrong. But it's around you, just the whole point I want you to notice is that day six is long. There's eight verses given to it. There's a lot of space given to it. And so space and detail says pay attention. What's going on here? God's communicating something to us. Um, and so that says, take note. In addition, we also have a structure in this last 
in this sixth day, not the last, um, there's a unique structure going on here. Uh, in Hebrew, and I think we talked about this when we were talking about Psalms a while back, um, there's often a structure that's called a, a chiasm, where it goes in and it comes back out. Um, my father-in-law, Dave, uh, studied and looked at these all across the Old Testament, and there, there's beautiful literary structure in Scripture. And in Genesis, in these verses, in 24 to 31, we have a structure in which they parallel each other. So it begins, as Doreen read for us, giving to us the accounts, right, of, you know, let us do this, uh, the creation of the animals, and it's declared. And at the end of the account, after we have the creation of everything, it's declared very good. So we have this kind of frame there. And then stepping in, you get this note uh, that uh, where God says that he is going to create humans, right? Adam, humanity, in the image and likeness of God. And their purpose, they will rule over creation. And then in verse 28, you also get the blessing of humanity and the instructions that they should fill the earth and rule over creation. And at the center of the account is verse 27, in which God makes humanity in the image of God, male and female. He creates them in the image of God. And so verse 27 stands as sort of the, the center and the focal point of these verses. And so it invites us simply to pay attention to what is going on here. Uh, and it invites us to ask this important question, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? The image of God, as you'll note, is repeated three times in this passage. And that we are created, in fact, in the image of God. And so today what I want to do is just unpack the significance of this phrase. A few different ways. First, when we come to thinking about the image of God, notice that it is given to humanity. Notice in the text it says, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. In verse 26, and then the three times that it says this in 27, it repeats the word created. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. That's a lot of repetitions of the verb create, three times. It's the bara that we looked at back in Genesis 1. So God is doing a unique work of creation here. And it is something that he simply gives us. He gives us uh, this. We are made in his image. He is the one doing it. So even before we talk about what it means, we just have to recognize that it's a gift. It is something that is really given to us. I do like pictures, so stuff is coming. But it is, it is something that we do not earn. It's something that's declared and said divided. And I, I like this quote from Christopher Walken, uh, who says, whatever precisely it means, and he's going to go on to write a lot about what it means, but before this, whatever precisely it means to be in the image of God, he's, he wants us to know it is given to humanity by God, not something that humanity performs and then presents to God, expectant of a reward. Adam and Eve are created in the image of God. They do not achieve that status by the sweat of their brow. So what's the significance that this is something that is just given to us? It's not something we earn. Um, all of us, all humanity, every person that you encounter, everyone has the image of God, bears the image of God. We don't earn it, right? We don't have to worry about losing it. Uh, our status um, is not performance dependent or pretend or dependent on a particular capacity we simply are god's images it is something that is just declared about humanity uh, every person is an image bearer and that means that every one of us has that worth and dignity uh, every person we meet is an image bearer of our living and active god and I think it calls us, right? It calls us to respect, to honor everyone as image bearers. This is a beautiful 
part of what we believe as Christians, right? It reminds us that everybody has value as an image of God, uh, and that from conception, right, this is why we are people who believe in life from the very beginning, from conception, uh, that little child in the womb bears the image of God, and all the way to our death, we bear and beyond, we bear the image of God. It is not dependent on how active we are or on what our mental state is or our physical state. We always have and bear the image of God. And it's not always easy, right, to recognize this. Uh, but it is something I think that we must see, right? And we must fight against a tendency in our culture, right, to dehumanize those who we don't agree with. There is a tendency to want to treat others who we disagree with or who we are at odds with as something less than human, as something less than an image bearer. Uh, this rhetoric can be found widely in our politics, right? It is easy to dehumanize the other side. But we must resist that. As Christians, we recognize that each of us and every person bears the image of God. That is given. And we'll talk about what it means to bear that image and how do we reflect that well, right? And what it's calling us to. But to begin, it's something that is given and declared about us. Um, thus, our worth and our dignity, right, are gifts from God. And that's why we have a basis when we talk about, you know, um, human, human value and worth. Christianity has a reason for that. Right, because we are image bearers of a living God. So it's a gift, it's given, it's declared, we're created this way. So what does it mean what, when it comes to these terms, image and likeness, what do we know about these two terms? Right? We've been studying kind of we're talking about trustworthy words. I'm gonna break down a little bit uh, some of these terms for you. The meaning of image. So just the, the word image, which is used uh, several times in this passage, right? Uh, it's not, it's a kind of rare word in the Hebrew Bible. It only occurs 17 times. Uh, and five of those times are in Genesis, four of them right here in our passage. And then again, Adam, Seth is said to be in the image and likeness of Adam. Uh, and then 10 other times, what we're going to find is that it often refers to physical images, what we think of as idols. And so just some examples, in, ex in Numbers it says, destroy heart images and their cast idols and demolish all their high places, all their cast images, all their selims, right? Uh, and then in 2 Kings, uh, it is gonna say the same thing. Sorry, did I go too far? There we go, there they all are. Uh, all the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They smashed the altars and the idols to pieces. Or again, in Ezekiel, they took pride in the beautiful jewelry and used it to make their detestable idols. They made it into vile images. Therefore, I will make it a thing unclean for them. So often in scripture, the term selom actually refers to these idols that, that people make of their gods and their deities. So it is uh, an image. Um, sorry, and then next, ah, you think I never use PowerPoint, I do, but there's also, a, so we are made in the image and the likeness of God. Well, likeness is just it's an abstract noun for those of you who love grammar, and it's related to the verb to be like or to resemble something, and it can be used to denote a model or a plan, right? So it is often translated something like or the likeness of. So in 2 Kings, uh, the king sends a plan for an altar, and it's this word. So to create another altar in the plan of this one, um, often it's used 10 times in Ezekiel to refer to the likeness of a man, or the, the appearance of, or something it has, uh, the likeness or appearance of something, right? So there's a likeness, there's a relationship uh, between the two. 
And interestingly, the, both of these terms, image and likeness, are found on this statue of a king um, named Haru Yithi. It's important. And he was the king over in Mesopotamia. And he placed his statue in a territory across the river. And the statue of the king represented his presence in this new territory, sort of like we'll go and a country will go and plant a flag in, in a territory to say, this is, this is our land, right? This is our place. The kings would place statues in another territory, and it would represent that their presence there, their control of that region. And so um, the statue of the king, as I said, it represents his presence, and it refers to the statue as the image and likeness of the king. Um, and the images of the gods that we were talking about, those idols, the selim, they also represented the presence of the god in their temples, right? They represented their presence, they represented their power, um, their, their place there. And so what we see in the ancient world, sorry, is that the language of image and likeness means that we are uh, uniquely God's representatives in his creation, right? This points to our unique role as representatives of God in creation. And what we'll see as his representatives in creation, it gives us a couple of important points. It means if you look at the next verses, right, after each time it talks about being made in the image and likeness of God, verse 26 says, right, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And then in verse 28, after the creation of mankind, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So we are, simply put, we are God's representatives. We are his stewards, his ambassadors, on and in the world that he has made. We are God's presence in the world. Isn't that kind of a crazy thing? Right? God decided that he would work through humanity, through us, to mediate his presence, to mediate uh, his desires, his rule over his creation. He made, we've been looking at, he made this amazing, vast, beautiful, wild, kind of wonderful world. And he placed humanity in it to steward it, to watch over it, to be his presence in this place that he has made, right? That we would be his images, like an idol in a temple, right? Um, the idols, the images of God in the world that he has created which helps to answer that question, right? Why am I here? So the ancient world said, to feed the gods. God comes along and says, no, no, no. You're not here to feed me. Notice what he does. He says, you think like, why does God take all this time to tell them that they've got the trees to eat, that's food for them? It's because everywhere else, the work of humanity was to feed the gods. He says, no, no. I've made a whole world to give you food. You don't have to worry about giving me food, right? I'm not here so that you can feed me. Sounds silly, right? But don't we sometimes get into a mindset of what does God need, right? He desires us, right, to, to be his presence, to be his representatives. And he cares for us. He is going to feed them. He has given them a bountiful world that would be food for them. And we'll talk more about some of these things in the coming weeks, too. Um, even this the language of what it means to be representatives. I think Myron will be, will be unpacking for us in a little bit in Genesis 2. But it helps us again to answer that question of why am I here? We're here because God desired to have people who would take his presence and to take his, his stewardship, his care, his rulership out into the world. But what, um, so we are God's images. We are those who bear his image into the world. Uh, but notice, I want to just unpack a little bit more some of the significance of this fact that we are 
that we are God's image, right? That we are imaged and made to reflect God. Um, the language speaks something to our core identity. God, right, is the image maker, and we are the image bearers. God is the origin, of course, he's the creator, he's the source, and we are merely the image and the reflection of that. Uh, clearly, we are not divine, right? But bear is the divine image as we're in the likeness of him. So we are called, right, to reflect God in this world. Uh, we are his images, not our own images. So all of this, right, this idea that there is a source and we're a reflection of that source means if there's a source and we're to reflect it, we have to be in relationship to that source. It's fundamentally a relational word. Uh, it fundamentally means that we have to be in relationship with God to do this, uh, to, to accurately reflect him. The shape, uh, a, a writer, a teacher that I had in seminary, he writes that the shape of the canonical story suggests that the overriding relation of the image, uh, humans, right, to the origin, the triune God, is that of worship, honor, completion and satisfaction. Um, furthermore, he says, human identity is rooted in what it reflects. So that question of who I am, right, is rooted in what I reflect. In other words, to be images of God means humans were made to find their identity in relationship. We have a lot of discussion around identity in our culture today. Lintz argues that our identity is found in relationship. And it is found in a relationship with God. Uh, and this is one of the, I think, one of the powerful things that, that we offer, that we declare, is that we are relational beings. We are fundamentally relational. We're fundamentally created to be in relationship. And a relationship between a source, God, right, the origin, and those who reflect that source. We're like mirrors, right? And we can point ourselves in certain directions. And the reality is that what we're pointing to is going to shape who we are. Because we're made to reflect. We're made um, to bear another's image. And so the story of scripture, of course, begins with the creation of God's image bearers. Reflecting him in a garden. But it takes a pretty disastrous turn, as, as we know, and we'll look at. But I just want to trace a little bit the, the canonical shape, the, the, where this image bearing goes, and makes a few reflections on that. Um, what we find, of course, in this disastrous turn is that the image bearers turn away from the source, from the true image, from God. And they listen to another voice, right? Adam listen to the serpent's voice in the garden. And the result then, of course, is this fracturing and this divide between source and image. Uh, if this helps, think of a Wi-Fi router in your home, right? It's designed to broadcast a signal that allows you to connect to the internet. But you can have great network strength. You know, you think, oh, good, my, my, it's really good. But if it's not connected to the internet, it's not going to do you a lot of good, right? You ever log on, you're like, my strength is great, but the internet connection is down. Um, it does no good. We're a little bit like those routers, right? We're designed to project God's images, image in the place that we are. But if we lost connection to the source, we're not aligned with how we were created, right? We're going to be projecting empty signals, um, or we'll be projecting whatever we've linked and hooked ourselves into. Um, not that you should think of God as the internet, but it's just a, just a, a a thought. Uh, so the relationship is broken. And what happens, and of course, because we're image bearers of God, uh, it means that we're designed to reflect something. We need that relational connection. Uh, and so humanity turned away from God, and thus our identity becomes marred, right? We become out of alignment. Uh, because we were designed to bear another's image, to reflect, we were designed to be in that relationship of worship, of another in which we find our completion and satisfaction, we go looking for it, right? Like a Wi-Fi router, we want a source. Uh, 
like a mirror, were designed to reflect another. Uh, and this is why the worship of something other than God, idolatry, is so pervasive in Scripture and really throughout our world, right? We were made to worship. We were made to find that relational connection. We're image bearers. We're made to find relational wholeness with God because we were simply made to reflect him because we're his images and our identity is found in that relationship. And it's why idolatry is not only so common but so powerfully destructive because when we worship something other than God, it begins to shape us into the thing that we worship. We begin to be conformed to it. Greg Beale notes that we become what we worship. I think uh, in Sunday school, they, they were talking about this too. Uh, scripture portrays this powerfully. Israel at Mount Sinai, do you remember what they make? What do they set up? A golden calf, right? Do you know what Israel is that referred to many, many times? They're said to have a, a stiff neck because they're becoming like that calf. If any of you have tried to lead a, a calf, you know how they can buck their heads. Or if you're feeding them a bottle, they can start bucking their heads. They have stiff necks, right? So Israel is becoming stiff-necked like the calf that they have worshipped. Not only do they become stiff-necked, but like the idols that cannot see or hear or speak, what does Israel become spiritually? They become spiritually blind. They become spiritually deaf. They become spiritually mute because they are more and more, as they follow these idols, becoming like them, dulling their spiritual senses, right? Increasing the thickness of their necks. They are becoming like what they have set their hearts upon. And so Linz notes that promising blessing, the idol creates bondage. And promising protection, it creates insecurity. Because when we set our hearts on things other than God, it begins to twist our hearts, right? It begins to pervert them and corrupt them. It consumes us and eventually the idol possesses us because we have begun to worship the creation instead of the creator. But all hope is not lost, right? Israel turned to the other gods, but God pursued. He redeemed Israel in order to restore relationship with them, right? That they might represent him to the nations around them. But you know that that continues. They continue to struggle with idolatry. Uh, they were called to be his images, but they keep continuing to struggle with uh, reflecting the veils and the gods around them. Uh, but yet God, he continues to work. He continues to pursue them. Uh, if you think of the tabernacle and the power that God said, you cannot represent me in an image. Why? Because we're his images. And so uh, one of our colleagues at the seminary makes this point that there's one time a year where there is an image in the Holy of Holies, and it's when the high priest walks into the Holy of Holies, right? The image of God has entered into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for his people. Because uh, God made us his images, not a carved statue. struggle, God would continue to pursue until he would send the true image, right? He would send us the true image to rescue and restore us as his image bearers. Um, and it is the beauty that we see in scripture, right? Reading from 2 Corinthians, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God, right? He is the true image. He came to show us what it meant to be God's presence in the world, to represent him in the world. And he came to rescue and restore the, us as fallen and marred images. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servant for Jesus Christ. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, right? Creation made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. When we see Christ, we see the perfect representation of the image of God. The sun is the image of the invisible God.
God, the firstborn over all creation. Jesus is the perfect image who entered our world, right, to break the power of the idol, to break those things that possess our hearts, that consume us, uh, sin and death, and to restore us to God and to our role as image bearers. In him, we are reconnected, and our purpose and our identity are restored. And it is why we worship, right? He is worthy of that worship, and it is in that worship that we find satisfaction and we find completion because it's him who gives us our identity. He gives us our identity and he helps us to know why we are here, right? To be his hands and his feet, uh, to be empowered by the spirit of God. We are here, as Paul said, to be those ambassadors of reconciliation, broken and restored image bearers. We are God's images, right? We are sons and daughters of God. Uh, our identity is not something we construct through a myriad of our choices. Our identity is found when, when we turn to Jesus, right, in repentance, when we honor him and we worship him, we speak with him and we walk with him, right? Because it's in Jesus that we find our completion and that satisfaction. We find the one we were always made to reflect in the world, right? We find our place at that family table. Uh, and so it is just a reminder in our day and age, there are many things that are presented to worship, right? There are still many things that want to consume our hearts, but those things will possess us. And they will not give us the blessing or the security that they promise, because they cannot. They cannot do it. But Jesus can. And he does. And this morning, uh, we are going to we celebrate that right by taking communion. And what I want you to remember as you take communion, that as you look at these faces on the screen, right, we are God's images, right? Each one of us. And if I missed your picture, please, it was not intentional. I was pulling from the online the the copy of a directory that happened to have been mailed to me, which was nice. But, but I want you to actually look for a minute and just recognize that we truly are. When you look at one another, yes, you're looking at your friend who you may have known for decades, but you are really looking at someone who bears the image of God, someone who is seeking to become more like Christ each and every day, and that we can walk with each other on that journey to be more fully God's image bearers, right? To represent him more fully, uh, to love more fully, as we go about it. But we don't do that in our own strength. The communion is that reminder that we are fed at the king's table, that he is the one who sustains us uh, each and every day. And so as we, we come, you may, um, we'll do as we typically do, to come into the aisles, we'll have, we'll serve you the cup and the bread will be at the table and there's baskets on the side to place your cup. But if you want to pause for a moment at the front, feel free to do so. Um, if you want to take it back with you and eat it at your seats, feel free to do so. Um, but it's just a reminder that uh, we are connected. Uh, it is in relationship that we find our identity and who we are and what God has called us to be in this world. And, uh, and that as we look around, we encounter every day people who bear the image, each one of us who bear the image of God. So let us um, let's move into communion. Uh, I will read the words from the Apostle Paul that just reminds us that the communion table is for all who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus. Uh, it is a gift. Uh, it is a reminder of Christ's sacrifice. A reminder that he sustains us, that his presence, his love, his work is what sustains us in this world. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Right? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come and eat.